Amen. I invite you to take your Bibles and turn with me to Ruth chapter 2. Ruth chapter 2, as this morning, we're going to turn the story a little bit in the life of Ruth. How wonderful it is to sing about God's overwhelming grace. Grace that is greater than all of our sin, all of my sin, and all of your sin, and all of our sin put together. God's grace is greater still, and that is precisely what we're going to be introduced to this morning. As we see in Ruth chapter 2, a a turn of events that look a bit different than they've looked in chapter 1. Just a little background, if you've been with us or if you're catching us for the first time this morning, we uh, finished Ruth chapter 1 last week, and We saw the uh, uh, results of Naomi and Elimelech's sin catching up with them. They they experienced a famine there in Bethlehem. They left. They traveled to Moab where their sons married two Moabite women. And then Naomi experiences the death of her husband, Elimelech, and her two sons. And she's left with her two daughter-in-laws, Ruth and Orpah. And uh, she gives them a decision as she hears after 10 years that there is bread back in Bethlehem, the house of bread, God's promised land, his place of provision. Though they've traveled outside of that, Ruth experiences word that God is providing for his people in Bethlehem, and she's going to travel back. But she gives her daughter-in-law's awful advice. She says, you go back to Moab, go back to sin, go back to the place where you were raised. And when that sounds like good advice, but really it's awful advice. She's not telling them just to go back to their, uh, to their family, she's telling them to go back to sinful Moab. Instead of journeying to the place where they would experience God, Yahweh God, and God's provision, she says, go back. And we see Orpah having a lot of emotion, but she chooses to go back to Moab. Emotion in worship does not mean we're following God. You can have emotion, but your emotion better lead you to cling to God, and that is what Ruth does. She clings to Naomi. She tells Naomi, where you go, I will go. Your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. Ruth's declaration was not just faithfulness to Naomi. It was faithfulness to God. And as we pick up this morning in chapter 2, we are going to see Uh, the blessing that comes from Ruth's decision, not only to her, grace in her life, but grace that comes through her to Naomi as well. Remember in chapter 1, Naomi has turned into a bitter person. Her name means pleasantness, but she tells in in chapter 1, in verse 20, Do not call me Naomi, but call me Mara, meaning bitterness, for the Lord has dealt with bitterly with me. She blames God for her problems. And we're going to see, despite all of these uh, misunderstandings, all of the faults that uh, Naomi has and all of the blaming God that she has done, God's grace will be bestowed upon her. This morning, before we go any further, I want you to know, no matter what, you cannot out the grace of of God. No matter what, it doesn't matter if you're living in sin right now, if you've been living a lifestyle of sin opposed to God and God's Word, it doesn't matter if you're in a heap of trouble paying the prices for your sin, it doesn't matter where you are in the past, where it's brought you today, God's grace is present. God's mercies are new every morning, and God does not want to withhold His grace from you. Well, let's look at Ruth chapter 2 and see what God's Word tells us about this grace we know. And we're going to look at the whole chapter, but we're going to break it up this morning a few verses at the time. So let's look beginning in verses 1 through 3. It says, Now Naomi had a kinsman of her husband, a man of great wealth of the family of Elimelech, whose name was Boaz. And Ruth the Moabitess said to Naomi, Please let me go to the field. Uh, and glean among the ears of grain after one in whose sight I might find favor. And she said to her, Go, my daughter. So she departed and went and gleaned in the field after the reapers. And she happened 
to come to the portion of the field belonging to Boaz, who was of the family of Elimelech. What do we learn in the first three verses about Ruth's decision and God's grace in our lives today? First thing I want you to see from this passage is that God calls us to live by faith. If we're going to experience the grace of God, if we're going to enjoy the grace of God daily, if we're going to see God's overwhelming grace in our lives, we have to live day by day, decision by decision, by faith. Ruth is there. Uh, Chapter 2, verse 1, we're introduced to this new setting, new scene, if you will, in the story of Ruth. And uh, we're told Naomi has a kinsman of her husband, a man of great wealth of the family of Elimelech, and we're told his name, Boaz. Now, this is a little background introduction that the author of Ruth is giving us because he knows how the story is going to unfold. He's kind of giving us a precursor, if you will, to see where Ruth is going to end up. Uh, We know from Leviticus that there was a Levitical law, which we'll get into later in the story of Ruth, about a kinsman redeemer. If a husband died... Uh, he has in a certain redeemer in his family met the qualifications of a kinsman redeemer. He could uh, fulfill those qualifications and carry on the family line, which was very important for uh, women in that day. And uh, Bo, there's a man back in Bethlehem where Ruth and Naomi have ended up. Remember last week at the time of the barley harvest. What do we know about barley harvest? Well, barley harvest is the introduction of the harvest time. Barley is poor man's bread. Wheat is rich man's bread. Wheat harvest follows barley harvest. So Naomi and Ruth come back to Bethlehem at the beginning of barley harvest, which would experience several months of harvest time, not only of barley, but of wheat to follow. And we're going to see Ruth enjoying the aspects of all that is to come. But they come here and they, they find a man in Bethlehem whose name is Boaz. The author is raising awareness for the reader, for you and I today, to say this man Boaz is going to be a central character in the book of Ruth. We're told in verse 1 that Boaz is a man of great wealth. Hebrew word gibor, meaning a man of wealth, prominence. Uh, uh, position there in Bethlehem. What's interesting is that this Hebrew word gabor is also used sometimes in the Old Testament to relate to God. God is called in the Old Testament sometimes El Gabor, meaning God uh, is the God of plenty. God has it all. And here we find Boaz, who is going to be a godly character in the life of not only Ruth, but Naomi and all of this process Boaz enters a picture, a man of great wealth. Uh, So Ruth, in verse 2, asks to go. Look there how we're told, we're reminded that she is a Moabitess. And and we're going to see this often in in, in chapter 2 as Ruth is uh, introduced, as she's labeled, that phrase, Moabitess cannot escape her. (laughs) Author's reminding us of who Ruth is. And I want you to see that before we go any further. A woman in Hebrew circles that would be looked upon as unworthy to experience the grace of Yahweh. Outside the family of God. Outside the people of God. She's not an Israelite. She's a wicked Moabitess. The one who the Israelites were forbidden to associate with. They were certainly forbidden, uh, discouraged from marrying. And yet Ruth comes into play not because of status, position, or authority, but because of faith. Ruth had enough faith to leave Moab. She had enough faith to journey with Naomi to this new place that she did not know called Bethlehem, the house of bread, the place of God's provision. But we're going to see just how much faith she had in verse 2. Ruth the Moabite said to Naomi, please let me go to the field. Not meaning she did not have in mind that she would pick Boaz out to go to his field. Let's make that clear because the text wants us to see that. Ruth is using uh, the field, her, her labeling of the field in generic terms. We could say, let me go to a field. Uh, let me go to the field. It's kind of like us saying, let me go to the store. I don't know which store I'm going to go to, 
uh, but I'm going to go to the store. And so Ruth is, is asking Naomi, she says, uh, please let me go to the field and glean among the ears of grain after one in whose sight I may find favor. We see that Ruth did not know that where she was going. She did not know where she would end up. But she's saying, uh, it's, it's t- harvest time. We're hungry. We've come back to Bethlehem so that we could find food. We could find provision. So let me go to the field and work and glean after wh- whomever I may find favor with so that I can bring back provision for us. Ruth asked to go and to glean for her and Naomi. What does this show us about Ruth? Not only her faith, it shows us she's not lazy. She did not come to Bethlehem just to sit in the house and wait for provision to come to her. She cannot sit idle. She's proactive about seeking provision for her and her mother-in-law, her mother-in-law who's not been too kind to her at this point. She's allowed her to come, but only after Ruth persuading her that I'm going. It doesn't matter, quit telling me to go back to Moab, I'm going with you. This is my decision. We see Ruth here as being very proactive and wanting to go out into the fields and to glean after the harvesters. What do we know about this process? Leviticus also uh, gives us um, a clue of what's going on here. When it was harvest time in the Old Testament, it was um, not only Levitical law, meaning law for Hebrews, for God's people, but it was also pretty common cultural law that uh, when when, uh, foreigners, when Uh, poor people needed food to eat and it was harvest time that the harvesters would actually be required to leave behind uh, part of the harvest for the poor the widow to come along behind and to receive some food to take for themselves I want you to understand as we go throughout Ruth the book of Ruth we're going to see this more so in just a minute God has always been concerned for the poor God has always been concerned for the least of these. This is not just a New Testament reality where we see Jesus coming along. All in the Old Testament, God commanded his people to care for the least of these. It was not a social concept. It was not up to the government or society. It was up to God's people. God expected his people to be the first to care for those who could not care for themselves. So much so that we find it Levitical law that harvesters, those harvesting grain, would have to leave behind part of the harvest for gleaners to come and to take. And so that's what Ruth is talking about. We know that this is not just a, a Hebrew concept because, remember, Ruth is not a Hebrew. She's a pagan. So perhaps she was used to this in Moab. It was a part of cultural understanding, but God said, my people are to lead the way in doing this. And so Ruth is basically saying in verse 2, let me go out and let me practice gleaning and maybe by chance I will experience someone kind enough to let me glean in their fields. Because how much do we know just because it's law doesn't mean people are going to abide by it, especially in this day. You say, what do you mean? Ruth is written during the time of the Judges. What do we know about the time of the judges? Kind people were few and far between during the period of the judges. If you want to know about the period of the judges, read the book of Judges and see just how evil the world was at this time. The Bible says everyone did what was right, what? In his own eyes. Not what was right by the law. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Well, Let's just uh, do a little uh, sociology experiment and say, when human beings are left to do what is right in their own eyes, what do we often default to? Being selfish, don't we? Doing what I want to do. And so if you're a harvester in this day and you're harvesting your product, the fact that you're going to require your workers to leave behind grain to glean has probably not been a common reality. It may have been law, but... Human nature, especially during this period of life in uh, in the history of Israel, is everybody was doing evil. They were doing what was right in their own eyes. So Ruth is saying, maybe by chance I will happen on a field where some kind soul will let me glean just a little bit so that we will have food to eat. Ruth is not lazy. 
She's not going to sit idle. She's going to be productive. She's going to be proactive. But look at Naomi's response. Go, my daughter. (laughs) Do you sense the bitterness still in Naomi? She's not given a blessing on Ruth. She's certainly not offered to help Ruth and say, well, let us both go. We can do double the work. She just said, go, my daughter. Not bye. See you later. Hope you come back safe. Hope you find a field to glean in. Just go. Verse 3, so she went, she departed and went and gleaned in the field after the reapers. And look, she happened to come to the portion of the field belonging to Boaz, who was of the family of Elimelech. That is the author's way, kind of using sarcasm, to show us the providence of God. Let me tell you something. As this story unfolds, Ruth did not just happen to come to Boaz's field, okay? This is God at work. This is the the author of Ruth giving us a little bit of uh, uh, sarcasm to point us to the providence of God. She happened to come to the field of Boaz. This is not something that just happened. By the way, things just happened. God is providentially caring for Ruth. God's grace is working in her life. He is bringing her to a place of, let's, let's recount this. She set out to find a place to glean, someone who would be kind. She finds a wealthy man who has a large field and is is, uh, reaping a pretty big harvest. He's a kind man. Kind men in this day and age were pretty much unheard of. They did not exist. This is the period of the judges. Not only is he a wealthy man, a kind man, But he's Boaz. He just happens to be Elimelech's kin, who was the one who would fulfill the role as kinsman redeemer. We'll know more about that later. She did not just happen to come to this portion of field. This is Ruth living by faith, and God is orchestrating her to the exact place at the right time, the beginning of barley harvest, to the right field, the right man, who God would use to show abundant blessing on Ruth. God, using this Levitical aspect of gleaning to bless Ruth. God cares about the needy. God cares about the poor. God cares about the downtrodden. God may own the thou, uh, a cattle on a thousand hills, and he does everything that is of this, everything that we have, everything we possess, everything we could have is God. God owns it all, but all throughout the Bible, God cares about the poor. And not only is Ruth poor, she's a poor alien. She's not uh, of the common faith of Yahweh God of, of the Hebrews. She is from Moab. God requires responsibility, uh, generous responsibility from his people. We see here, Boaz is going to fulfill the role to allow Ruth to glean in his field. He didn't have to. He could have broken the law. Ruth did not just happen here. And what I want you to understand this morning is as you live by faith day by day, things will not make sense to you sometimes. Your life, you don't know today. You don't know right now what God is orchestrating behind the scenes to bring you to the right time, the right place, the right purpose, to show you blessing upon unending blessing in your life. But I promise you this, as you live by faith, those things don't just happen. They are part of the hand of God in your life. Because Ruth chose to live by faith, and that's what God requires of us today. In fact, the writer of Hebrews says, without faith, it is not hard to please God. It is impossible to please God. And faith calls us to step out and do things we cannot do on our, on our own. Ruth, was not a, 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 she was not a farmer. She couldn't provide for herself. She was in a foreign land among a foreign people. She knew nobody. And yet she's t- stepping out on faith to go to a field to hope that someone would allow her to glean in a wicked time where there, weren't, there were not many nice people around. And Ruth's life could have been taken from her. Because a lot of times, robbers would come along and kill people and take what they had gleaned. 
And yet here she is stepping out on faith. Can I ask you this morning, where is God calling you to live by faith? What decisions is God calling you to do that is outside of your ability? You know, it's when we step outside of our ability that we really begin to trust in God's ability. If we're just doing what only we can do, then what faith is that? But God calls us to live by faith. Not only that, God calls us to live in His grace. He calls us to live in His grace. Look with me, beginning in verse 4 through verse 16. It says, Now behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem and said to the reapers, May the Lord be with you. And they said to him, May the Lord bless you. Then Boaz said to his servant, who was in charge of the reapers, Whose young woman is this? The servant in charge of the reapers replied, She's the young Moabite woman who returned with Naomi from the land of Moab. And she said, Please let me glean and gather after the reapers among the sheaves. Thus she came and has remained from the morning until now. She's been sitting in the house for a little while. Then Boaz said to Ruth, Listen carefully, my daughter. Do not go to glean in another field. Furthermore, do not go from this one, but stay here with my maids. Let your eyes be on the field which they reap and go after them. Indeed, I have commanded uh, the servants not to touch you. When you're thirsty, go to the water jars and drink from what the servants draw. Then she fell on her face, bowing to the ground, and said to him, Why have I found favor in your sight that you should take notice of me since I am a foreigner? Boaz replied to her, All that you have done for your mother-in-law after the death of your husband has been fully reported to me. And how you left your father and your mother and the land of your birth and came to a people that you did not previously know. May the Lord reward your work and your wages be full from the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to seek refuge. Then she said, I have found favor in your sight, my Lord, for you have comforted me and indeed have spoken kindly to your maidservant, though I am not like one of your maidservants. At mealtime, Boaz said to her, Come here that you may eat of the bread and dip your piece of bread in the vinegar. So she sat beside the reapers, and he served her roasted grain, and she ate and was satisfied and had some left. When she rose to glean, Boaz commanded his servant, saying, Let her glean even among the sheaves, and do not insult her. Also you shall purposely pull out for her some grain from the bundles and leave it, that she may glean, and do not rebuke her. When we respond in faith to God, we experience overwhelming grace of God every single time. You step out of your sin, you follow God, you seek to serve Him in faith, you seek even when you have responded in a famine, yet you come back to God. When you've been living in sin, you've been doing life your own way, and you decide a full commitment that you're going to serve God, you're going to trust His Word, you're going to take His Word to heart, and you're going to live for Him day in and day out. Let me tell you something, you will not go a second without experiencing the overwhelming grace of God. Ruth is experiencing this. Boaz shows up. He was present among his reapers. Now, he's the landowner. He's not out there necessarily reaping the grain. But this day, not only does Ruth end up at Boaz's field, a man of wealth, a kind man in the time of Judges, and a kinsman redeemer of Elimelech, but Boaz himself shows up. And he shows up, and as the harvest is going on, he sees Ruth. And he inquires of his servants, who is this woman? And they tell him, this is the Moabite woman who came with Naomi from the land of Moab. Boaz is a man, uh, let me just remind us of this. Boaz is evidence of good men living in bad times. And we need, we need to understand this before we go any further. The period that Ruth is living in, I've already told you, is extremely evil times. Um, we, some commentators say it could be much like the world today. Everybody's doing what is right in their own sight. Man, is that true of our nation, for sure. Everybody just wants to do what's right in their own sight. Forget God, forget other people, forget whatever. I'm just going to do what's right for me. And yet Boaz is evidence that it does not matter how evil of a time that we live in. God always preserves good, godly men. And can I say to those under hearing today, men and women, be those people. <laughs> be those people. Don't let the evil world persuade you to evil. Don't let the evil world persuade you to still live in Moab. Be somebody who is 
maybe a nobody by the world, but you're somebody in the providence and kingdom of God because you're not doing what is right in your own eyes. You, like Joshua has said, as for me and my house, we're gonna be faithful to God because when all is said and done, everybody else of this world is going to leave you for yourself. God is the only one who truly has your back. Ruth stepped out on faith and she experienced the grace of God. And the servant knows who she is and he tells Boaz... And, and, and Ruth catches Boaz's attention. Many commentators say she was beautiful, she was attractive, so she caught his attention. Uh, she was kind. We know that because of her interaction. She was, not, uh, 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 she was not presuming on Boaz's grace. She was not forceful. She said, please let me just glean after your harvesters. Let me just provide, get a little for myself. She was kind. She was hardworking. She was full of grace. The servant tells Boaz of her request, and Boaz looks at Ruth in verse 8, and he says, Listen, don't go to another field. Stay here. Stay here and glean. In verses 8 and 9, we see this uh, Hebrew word hesed come about, and that is a word that is used to describe overwhelming kindness from Boaz. It's also a word used to describe God. Are you getting a, a, a picture here that Boaz is um, an image of what godliness is supposed to be like in the world? He's not a perfect man, but he's a godly man living in ungodly times. He was a man with a lot of wealth and things in life, but he didn't let those things lead him to arrogance, lead him to say, forget the, par the foreigner, forget the poor. Forget the widow. He was a kind man. I believe kindness is a lost art in our world today. We, uh, especially in the American church, we have been so blessed that it's easy for us to become prideful and arrogant, and we forget that kindness is a fruit of the Spirit. God calls us to be kind people, and Boaz is certainly a kind man. We need more men like Boaz in the church and the world today. He looks to Ruth and he says, listen, my daughter, don't go glean in another field. Don't go from this one. Stay here with my maids. Let me provide for you. He's offering her not only provision of, of, of barley, but protection. My servants will protect you. And then he's providing her with water when you get hot. Go to the water jars and let the servants draw for you water. Now, that's a strange thing in and of itself because in that day, the women were supposed to go draw water for the workers. And Boaz says, no. You might be a Moabite. You might be an alien to this land. You might be poor. But I see you as somebody. I see you as somebody. When you, you certainly glean they're going to find protection here, but when you get hot, go, let my servant draw water for you. Then he invites her in at mealtime and shares a meal with her. All of this is unheard of. It might sound culturally acceptable for us, maybe for a really kind person, but in this day and age, this was rare. And Boaz is being extremely kind to her. And she says, why are you treating me this way? She fell before him, and he said, well, I heard reports of all the faith you've shown, how you've dealt kindly with your mother and how you've sought protection under Yahweh's wings. And Ruth realizes how undeserving she is, the grace that Boaz has given her. Oh, how this reminds us of the grace God has shown us. You and I all alike are just like Ruth coming to a foreign land. We don't have anything to offer. We are like poor beggars. And we come and we experience, when we, when we see the grace of God, we experience grace that is unimaginable. And, and if God's grace does not lead you to fall on your face and say, God, how could you love me so much? God, how could you forgive me so much? God, how could you be patient with me so often that something is wrong with our theology? Something is wrong with how we practically live in life. And we need to have a response like Ruth had before Boaz. We need that response before God and fall on our face and say, I'm unworthy. But God, I trust your provision. 
Your grace has, has uh, been bestowed upon me and it is totally captivating me. But Lord, you are worthy. Can I ask you this morning, have you experienced the grace of God? Grace that saves you, grace that meets you in your sin. Let me tell you something. If you're here with us physically, if you're watching some other means, it doesn't matter who you are and it doesn't matter what you've done. God's grace is there. God's grace is there. God does not show more grace to someone who is, um, or a different kind of grace to someone who's been raised in church and lived a, quote, religious life all their life and someone who has done the worst things imaginable. We all in need God's grace, the same kind of grace and the same amount of grace. No sin is worse than any other sin. Sin is sin, and Jesus died for it all. We're all equal in God's sight, and so it's time we start living like that as people of God. And no matter what we've done, God's grace is here today. But if we're going to be saved by it, if we're going to be changed by it, we have to receive it. We have to trust in it. Just as Ruth received Boaz's grace and she gleaned in his field and she trusted his provision, we've got to trust the one who has done what you and I cannot do. God has worked through a generous and kind Man, And by the way, uh, that's what the Bible calls us to be as children of God, as we trust uh, God's grace and live by faith. God wants us to be kind people like Boaz, and he wants us to be generous people like Boaz. It was not God's plan in the Old Testament for the government to take care of the poor. It was God's plan that God's people would take care of the poor. That the church, if we want to say in modern age, would be the first leading the way to, to meet the needs of the community and society. Uh, uh, God is the best caretaker possible. And God's people, when we follow God's plan, are called to be generous and care for those who need help. You don't have to be wealthy to be generous. You have to be generous to be generous. And God can take whatever you have and can multiply it more than you ever could. Be like Boaz. And live in God's grace, live by faith. Lastly, live in hope. Look with me in verse 17. So she gleaned in the field until evening, then she beat out what she had gleaned, and it was about an ephod of barley. She took it up and went into the city, and her mother-in-law saw what she had gleaned. She also took it out and gave Naomi what she had left after, and she was satisfied. Her mother-in-law then said to her, Where did you glean today, and where did you work? May he who took notice of you be blessed. So she told her mother-in-law with whom she had worked and said, The name of the man with whom I work today is Boaz. Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, May he be blessed of the Lord who has not withdrawn his kindness to the living and to the dead. Again, Naomi said to her, The man is our relative. He is one of our closest relatives. Then Ruth the Moabite said, Furthermore, he said to me, You shall stay close to my servants until they have finished all my harvest. Naomi said to Ruth, her daughter-in-law, It is good, my daughter, that you go out with his maids and that others do not fall upon you in another field. So she stayed close by the maids of Boaz in order to glean until the end of the barley harvest and the wheat harvest, and she lived with her mother-in-law. If we respond to God by faith, we experience God's grace. In church, it gives us hope that it's not of this world. Ruth goes back to Naomi she takes what she has gleaned, and this, uh, perhaps this um, amount that we're told, an ephah of barley, makes no sense to her. But let me tell you something. Uh, this amount came back to Ruth and Naomi, and it was about enough for the two women to live on for a week. Pretty good amount. And we know Ruth stayed and she gleaned during the whole barley harvest and the whole wheat harvest, period of months. And if she equaled the same amount, which would have been likely day after day because of Boaz's generosity, this would have been enough barley and wheat for Ruth and Naomi both to live on for almost a year. A year's worth of food for Naomi and for Ruth. Grace led them to hope. Their circumstances are now changing. Chapter 1, Naomi was a bitter woman. Now she's a blessed woman. She's saying, blessed be this man 
who has dealt kindly with you. You see this? Naomi has moved from bitterness to blessedness. She introduces Ruth to the fact that this man is going to be their kinsman redeemer, and they have no idea the amount of blessings that are in store for them, but they're getting a little taste of it. (laughs) When you trust God at His Word, when you stake your life in faith on His will, when you come back to His will and you live in the center of His will, God gives you hope. You find His provision there. You find His grace, His faithfulness there. You trust His promises. And God gives you hope that this world cannot give. When I say I hope in God, it doesn't mean that like I say I hope it doesn't rain today. I have no control over that. It might, it might not. But when I hope in God, the Bible says that is a sure hope. When I say I hope in the fact that Jesus is coming back again, I know Jesus is coming back again. And I know it's going to be the way the book of Revelation says it's going to be be because God's word is true and without error. And this hope now that uh, grace and hope that Ruth and Naomi have experienced is something that has been beyond their imagination. But they have seen unending kindness in Boaz in the midst of a wicked, wicked world. And yet they're still Friends, can I tell you today, we might live in a wicked, wicked world, but there's still hope. Don't you dare get down. Don't get discouraged. Don't get defeated. Don't live like the world lives. Don't dabble in sin because everybody else is doing it and you think, well, Jesus hasn't come back yet. He's not going to come back in my lifetime. Don't worry when hard times come your way. Trust God. Put faith in Him. Let the faith that you read about and that you pray for become, begin to become sight when you have to practice it. And, and the, Jesus said, if we have faith just as small as a mustard seed, then we can move great mountains. Don't get down and out on the way this world is going. The way this world is going is all testament to the fact that the Bible is true. (laughs) Because the Bible told us this was going to happen thousands of years ago. And if you don't believe it's unfolding the way the Bible says it's going to unfold, then just study your Bible a little deeper. Your eyes will begin to be opened. So that shouldn't push me back in fear. That should push me to God in faith. God is looking for some men like Boaz today. God is looking for some women like Ruth today who would say, this might be a time where everybody's doing what is right in their own eyes, but I'm going to trust the Lord. I'm going to take Him at His word. I'm going to step out in faith. I don't know how God's going to provide. I don't know all the details of what it's going to look like. But I know God is going to be faithful. You may be going through some things today that seem like they're never going to work out. But if the, the book of Ruth tells us anything, it's that we have no idea how God is orchestrating the daily events of our life for a grander purpose. Remember, this lady by the name of Ruth, a Moabite pagan woman, ends up in the genealogy of Jesus. Little did she know how much she would be welcomed into the plan of God. I don't know where you are this morning. Maybe you're lost in your sin. Maybe you know that you're lost in your sin. Maybe your life is completely wayward and it's evident to you and to everybody else. And you don't think everybody, you think everybody else has turned their back on you, so certainly God would too. He hasn't and He won't. I want you to know I prayed for you this morning and If you're lost, pray that today would be the day of salvation for you, whether you're watching, whether you're here physically. God's kindness towards you is to save you. I don't deserve salvation. You don't deserve salvation. But God doesn't give us what we deserve. Thank God. (laughs) Or else none of us would have a chance. Maybe today's a day of salvation to you. Would you just respond in faith 
and see the overwhelming grace of God come into your life. Maybe you're here today as a child of God and you've been walking your own way. You've been trying to take matters in your own hands or you've been really questioning whether God can be trusted. He can. He can. All you have to do is take a small step of faith and see Him meet you there. Maybe we just need to come and pray this morning. Maybe to be men like Boaz. We live in a wicked world. Everybody's doing what is right in their own eyes. Men, it's time to step up and be a Boaz. Be kind. Be gracious. Stand on the truth of God's Word. Let God use you. And that's not just going to happen if you don't pray for the conviction and God's help to make it happen. Will we just maybe have a response? Will we come and pray for that? Ladies, everybody's doing what is right in their own eyes. Are you going to follow? Are you going to be a Ruth and say, I'm going to leave Moab behind. I'm going to step out on faith. I'm going to trust God and I'm going to give Him the glory by how I live my life, by how I carry myself, by how I live in faith. Would you just come and pray, maybe for conviction, because that too is not going to happen if we don't ask God daily to equip us. I don't know how God is calling you to respond this morning, but here's one thing I know. God's grace has been made completely evident before us. And no matter how much you sin, you cannot out the grace of God. So leave it behind. Come into His presence. Find yourself welcomed in His grace. And enjoy walking in His abundant provision. The story's almost all, only halfway over. There's more to come. You don't know what yet is to come in your life. But it will only happen as you're in the will of God and trust Him day by day. Father, we thank You for the story of Ruth. We thank You for Ruth. We thank You for Boaz. God, how awesome to know even as they're in Your presence today in eternity with all the heroes of faith and loved ones in our lives. God, we get to read about them. One day we will get to meet them. God, what a testament of faith they are to us. Whether we, uh, like Boaz, have been living in God's plan or whether we, like Ruth, have been a pagan outside of God's plan, your grace is the same for both. And Lord, I just pray that you would work in our hearts now as this is a time of worship, a time of response to you. Lord, if salvation is needed, then let it, be, let it happen today. God, maybe we need to come before you and pray for conviction to be a Boaz, to be a Ruth. God, just to say thank you for your grace. God, wherever we are today, don't let this time pass us by without honoring you and giving you what you're calling for in our lives. Lord, we love you, we trust you, and we ask it in your name. Amen.